Father God, we come before you right now, Lord God, and we offer this day to you, Lord, and we pray, O oh God, for your holy presence to fill us, to fill our uh, heart right now, O oh God, and give us the excitement, O oh Lord God, to learn from you. So thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Father. Bless everyone, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, so we are so privileged today. We have, I, uh, I will not be speaking. Uh, I invited a guest uh, today. And uh, so um, bear with us. And I hope you prepare your Bible, your notes, uh, your pen, your you know, uh, notebook or paper to write down and jot down all the uh, lessons you can learn today. So let me introduce to you our uh, guest speaker today. And she's uh, not new to all of us. As a matter of fact, she is the love of my life. <laughs> Uh, so let's all welcome my beautiful wife, Josie Lim. Yes, palakpakan naman. Yes, all. <laughs> Josie here. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. That's all I need. <laughs> yes, to know that I am the love. Amen. Okay, so today. Uh, we will be speaking about a really good topic. Um, this topic, I'm, I've actually been incubating this or um, reflecting on this for the last two years, I guess. And uh, it's only now that I had the... Um, um, courage <laughs> to share about this because uh, this is not a very easy subject to preach on right so we'll start today about the giants you can see that there's a giant there actually only that no giants whatsoever because Pastor Al said that we don't need to use the actual giants. We have to be current. It has to be relevant today. So instead of putting there Goliath and all those giants from, over, from old, uh, we put this one. Right. And uh, sometimes we think that giants are only, they only belong in. Um, fairy tales, or in our imaginations, but actually we would see that it's being mentioned in the Bible several times, and the most famous of that is the one I, I, I said before, it's Goliath, David and Goliath. And so today, I want to discuss about this giant, that although it, they, it is invisible to, our, to the human eye. We don't see it physically with our eyes. This giant of unbelief. But it actually affects us almost every day of our lives. And if we let it rule in our lives, it will take over. And everything you think, everything you say, how you act, how you react, how you respond to lives, situations and events like the pandemic today, the COVID-19, and the isolation and the panic buying and all that, how you react to all these things that are happening would be directly or indirectly by this, caused by this giant of unbelief. And so let's go on and we will see how it actually affects us. Right, so we will start with this verse, Psalm 42, 11, that's on NIV. And it said, why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. You might be familiar with this, but I don't want to stop that. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Actually, there are songs about that as well. 
Why are you so disturbed within me? I don't want to stop that. We'll go to the different translations. Now, in New Living Translation, it says, Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? Well, now we're getting there. It's becoming a little bit personal now. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? In, some, in, in, in the English Standard Version, it says, Why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Turmoil talks about a deeper one, deeper problem. And the Berean Study Bible says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why the unease within me? Some of you might not be in turmoil. You might say, I'm not really discouraged. I'm not really sad. But you can feel an unease. There's something there in your heart. There's, an, there's something that's not good. And you can't define it. It's unease. And contemporary English version says, why am I discouraged? Why am I restless? Any one of you in particular feeling this way this morning or in the past few weeks? Maybe. So let's go on. Now, you know, during this, oh, there's still more. Contemporary English version says, why, I, why am I discouraged? Why am I restless? And the New English Translation Net Bible says, why are you depressed, oh my soul? Why are you upset? Now, this one here is very common. You know, during my time, uh, don't ask when, <laughs> Wait, long, long, long time ago, long, long, long time ago, uh, depression is not yet a common word, especially in the Philippines. We're just sad, you know, we're lonely, we're upset, we're discouraged. Even in the Christian circles, it's like that, discouraged, you know. But nowadays, if someone is crying because of something that happened, and then tomorrow that someone cries again, they, they say, you're depressed. If someone feels a little bit lonely, you're depressed. So this one is really, this will really speak to us now. Why are you depressed, oh my soul? Why are you upset? Okay. You know, the Lifeline group uh, executive said that these past weeks during the pandemic, there have been 24,000 calls to them every week. They have been getting 24,000 calls a week during this pandemic from people who say they are so discouraged, they are so lonely. And the issues about mental health just spike up. It increased a lot during this time. And you know what? These people, the, the societal thoughts of these people who are calling, the self-harm, the depression, it just increased during this pandemic. Why? Can't cope. And they said, it just feels like there's no one there for us. There's no one who cares. We feel alone. You know, 24,000 calls a week, is that's too much. I hope you're not one of them who's been calling. <laughs> uh, OK. So we'll check the promise. This is about entering God's rest. We will talk about God's rest, and we will talk about unbelief. We'll go back and forth. Right. In Hebrews chapter 4, 1 to 3, New Living Translation, we will read this. God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us, just as it was to them. But it did them no good, because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. 
I will repeat that, for only we who believe can enter his rest. As for the others, God said, in my anger I took an oath, they will never enter my place of rest. Even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. And in verses 6 to 7, it says, So, God's rest is there for people to enter. It is there for you and me to enter. But those who first heard this good news failed to enter because, what? They disobeyed God. So, God set another time for entering his rest. And that time is when? Today. Not tomorrow. Not a year after. Today. So God set another time for entering his rest, and that time is today. God announced this through David much later in the words already quoted. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. So I am sending this message to every one of you who is watching today. This is what God is saying to you. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Now, there's a problem, though. We have a problem. God gave the promise, and this promise is about entering his rest. This, the, this promise was given to the people of God before, but just as we read, it did not profit them, them anything. They were not able to enter God's rest. You know why? Because of disobedience. But God said another day for entering God's rest. And when is that day? Today. But we have a problem. The problem is unbelief. So what is this problem? Let's read. It's back in Hebrews chapter 3. The one that we read before was Hebrews 4. So this is Hebrews chapter 3. That is why the Holy Spirit says, Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. When they tested me in the wilderness, there your ancestors tested and tried my patience even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. It took 40 years <laughs> to test God's patience. So I was angry with them and I said, their hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. And in verse 11, so in my anger I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. And this is the exhortation to us by the author of Hebrews. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters, make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. That's the exhortation. Talks about the people from of old, the ones who traveled in the wilderness, who journeyed in the wilderness, with Moses at the head of them. And they were not, and they were not able, these, these people, these Israelites who came out of Egypt under Moses, only two were able to enter the promised land. The rest of them were the ones who were born during the wilderness journey. But the ones who actually left, the ones who actually came out of Egypt, only two of them, Caleb and Joshua, even Moses and Aaron, weren't able to enter. And it's because of what? Because they disobeyed God. And then this is the exhortation for us today. Be careful then, brothers and sisters, and this is for you and for me, make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. Later on, we will discuss what it means about, what, what he means about evil and unbelieving and about being disobedient. Now, 
We will continue this. And who was it who rebelled against God? Even though they heard his voice, wasn't it the people Moses led out of Egypt, what I was discussing before? And who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who seen, whose corpses lay in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when he took an oath that they would never enter his rest? Wasn't it the people who disobeyed him? So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. Previously, it was mentioned they disobeyed his voice. And then here it says, because of unbelief. Yeah, it makes sense. If you don't believe a person, you don't believe what he's saying. And if you don't believe what they're telling you or what they're saying and that person, you won't do what they say. It makes sense. Unbelief leads to disobedience. Disobedience is the result of unbelief. Right. Unbelief is described as hardening of hearts. Where did I get that? In those previous verses that we read. Right? Hardening of hearts. Hearts always turning away from God. Refusing to do what God tells them. Evil and unbelieving heart. And that's the NKJV version. Evil heart of unbelief. Right? In the, in the New King James, it says, evil heart of unbelief. Now let's go on. Now the failure of, we will discuss the failure of the Israelites to enter the promised land. First, we will discuss about the command. What was the command? In Numbers 13, 1 to 2, the Lord now say to, said to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. Now, if you're reading your Bible, you will be familiar with this account. What, what's happening here? They are already at Kadesh Barnea. After one year, almost a year of traveling from Egypt, you know, from Goshen where they were, and then the Passover happened, the firstborn of the Egyptians were killed. They were spared. The, the firstborn of the Israelites, Hebrews, were spared because of the Passover blood that they put on the, on the lintels of their doorpost. And then the Pharaoh told them to leave. Right? So they left. And a year they spent traveling, journeying in the, in that, from, to Mount Sinai, and you know what happened in Mount Sinai, and, and the giving of the law, but before that was the Red Sea, so all this happened during that period. And after almost a year, they were already here in Kadesh Barnea, only one year from Egypt. They were ready to possess the land. God is so excited. Moses is excited. All the people are excited. And this is what God told Moses. Send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Israelites. How did God describe this land? Land of flowing with what? Milk and honey. This is a land that is flowing with milk and honey, an abundant land, right? And so he said, okay, send spies. A leader sent one leader from each of the 12 ancestral. And, and then here's what happened. The 12 spies, including Caleb and Joshua, went. They explored the land. And remember when they came back, what did they bring? I can't imagine that because I haven't seen grapes like that. It was a time of the first harvest of grapes. And these are big men. These are, you know. Soldiers, military men, you know, the warriors. And they can't carry a bunch of grapes. These are strong men, they can't. How did they carry the grapes? <laughs> they put it in a, a big 
log of wood, put the grapes, the bunch of uh, bunches of grapes there, and two men had to carry it. Two men. How heavy is that? that? I can't imagine that. That's the harvest. And so it's true. What God was saying is true. This land is rich. This land is prosperous. That's what, that's, that land is the one that I'm giving you. Full of good things. You know, he's not giving the Israelites the worst land. He's giving them a really good abundant land. But you see, they came back and the, this is what they said, the bad report. This was the report to Moses. We enter the land you sent us to explore. And it is indeed a bountiful country. Well, they agreed. Yes, Lord. It's good. Really good. A land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. Well, it's obvious. The graves are there. Everyone can see it. But the people living there are powerful. And their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there. See? Told you about the giants. The descendants of Enoch. But Caleb, when Caleb heard that, immediately he said, he, Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. You know, Caleb was thinking, if God said, this is what he's giving us, then we will be able to conquer it. Then we will be able to get it, to, you know, to overcome those giants. No problem with that. We've seen how we defeated all those, you know, they, they had a lot of fight before. And he said, let's go. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. They, they not only said that in the presence before Moses, but they went around the tents and told the people, you know, the land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we, all the people we saw were huge. Exaggeration much? We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. How do you know? They didn't see them. But in their minds, that's what they will think. We felt like grasshoppers. Hey, is there a time in your life that you feel this way? There's a challenge. There's something that you have to do, or God is telling you to do something, and then you feel like, I can't go up against them. They're stronger than me. I can't. They... I felt that way when, you know, the Lord was telling me to preach about this giant of unbelief. I went back and forth, especially it's online. Uh, Pastor Al has already been so used to it. He's mastered it. He knows how to do it. He's done Tagalog versions. I've been watching him and he's like a pro. He looks like a pro. And I was imagining myself. Uh, uh. Actually, I was supposed to preach last week. But I was in that, in that, in that, in that. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I can't do it. It's on my side. Oh, how can I do it? You know, I was in that mode. I was in that mode. So I couldn't. And I told Pastor, I'm not ready. I haven't prepared my message. And so he said, okay, I'll, I'll preach on the blood covenant then. And he did. And this week, I was there again, but I was like, no, if I have to really be able to face this giant. So I did what I, 
I will pre I will share to you. Be able to overcome that giant of unbelief. All right, let's go on. Now, here we go. What does this mean to us? Those are giants during their time. Well, we know that after that, the Israelites were able to conquer the land, led by Joshua after Moses died. We know that, right? But these are not the same people who came out of Egypt. These are the, you know, the ones who were born, or maybe the kids during that time when they came out. What does this mean to us? Let's go get to the real thing right now. We've read the word, but what does this mean to us? Right. Let's go back to the promise. Remember the promise to them before? The God's rest. What does this mean to us about God's rest? Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. Oh, everyone would say, oh, I know that. I memorize that. I'm familiar with that. Yes. Yes, you're familiar with that. That's why I got an, a different translation, New Living Translation. And it says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Who is, who is he speaking there? Who's talking there? You know, everyone knows that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. Because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. We're not very familiar with the yoke. But those who have been farming, you know about the yoke. You know about that, that wood that's in, you know, the cows or carabao's <laughs> neck. He said, take my yoke. This yoke that I'm carrying, take this. Let me teach you. I'm humble. I'm gentle. You will find rest for your souls. You know, what, what Jesus Christ is saying here is, I'm not a cruel taskmaster. I'm not a cruel boss. I'm not a cruel employer. I'm gentle. I'm humble. Oh, only if our bosses are like this. Ooh. Yep, I've had a lot of boss like that, employers like that. And it's so good to work for them and with them, you know. Gentle and kind, humble. And when you go to work, you're not, I don't want to come to work, oh, it's so hard. He shouts at me, yells, screams at me. No. These kind of bosses, and I have a lot, I tell you. Even now, I have a boss, a boss that just talks to me like that. And I don't dread going to work because, you know, they're gentle. They are kind. But Jesus. It's more than them, a thousand times over, right? So, but although the Lord God gave us this promise, come, come, I will give you my rest. And yet we have a problem, unbelief. What do we call it today? We call it distress. We call it anxiety. We call it panic attack. We call it nervous breakdown. The Bible calls it unbelief. Oh, Sister Josie, you're too harsh. <laughs> you're too harsh. Really? Well, it's just stress. Just anxiety. It's just, you know. Panic attack where I can't, I can't really breathe. I can't really breathe. Yeah. Nervous breakdown. Oh, you know what? When I was about 21 years old, when I was leading a group of um, students, and then these students, I brought them to a community Bible study. And this Bible study, uh, we have a lot of older adult people 
and I was leading them. And uh, there came a point. I was 21, single, and I was so young. And I became born again at around 19 years old. So it was just two years. And I was already leading this group of people, and there, there, was, there were problems. We have our own business, and we were going all around the Philippines. And I even had to go to overseas to bring Bibles. And, you know, I was 21, and we had debts. We have bills to pay. We have love gifts to give, you know. And, and one night, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> I just, I couldn't breathe. And Papa Kua, oh, my beloved Papa Kua is going to be with the Lord now. He adopted me and Riz, Riza, one of the leaders. And he, 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 he learned about this. I, I told him about this, and I, was, I couldn't breathe. And they brought me an emergency hospital. So I couldn't breathe. But I was 21 years old. And the doctor, a lady doctor, started talking to me. And you know, BP, the regular checks, and the heartbeat, and all that. And she said, you're OK. I can't find anything wrong with you. <gasps> but I oh, uh, can't breathe. <laughs> and she said, Wait, what's your job? <laughs> I'm a pastor. <laughs> I, I, I'm a leader of a group. <laughs> OK, is what she told me. So you're a pastor. You're a Christian. You believe the Bible? Yes. You believe God? Yes. Start believing it, okay? Start just believing what you're teaching, okay? And I was like, what do you mean? Oh, well, this is a panic attack. Why are you panicking? You're going through a nervous breakdown. Why? Do you believe that God is able to save you and solve all your problems? Yes? So go home. Rest. <laughs> we went home. That was the first and last episode of my panic attack and nervous breakdown. And I was like, she was so harsh. But I learned. That's all right. The Bible calls it unbelief. All right? Sorry to be harsh, but yeah. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19. So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. Now, belief or trust in God is equal to rest of God. Unbelief is equal to what? Unrest. Unrest is equal to unbelief. For me, at least in my experience, whenever I feel unrest in my heart, I would ask God, where is this coming from, Lord? What is this? Is there anything that I don't believe you for? Is there any, any promise right now that I don't believe? What is this? Unrest. Now, I'm not saying that all of the things that you feel like, you're, oh, you're late for work. So there is unrest. Does this mean I have unbelief? Not the daily stresses of, I'm not talking about that, the daily grind of life. No, I'm not talking about that. You're late for the, you know, you're preparing dinner for your family and everyone's, you know, upset, it's late and all that, and you have this stress. And no, I'm not talking about the daily grind of life. I'm talking about the deeper unrest that you. Talking about those times that you really feel low. You just know there's something wrong. It goes deeper than the usual panic, usual stress. All right. Failure to enter God's rest. Here's the command. Hebrews 4.11 says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. So not everyone can enter this place of rest. Sorry to say, only those who are diligent to enter that rest. Those who would really come before the Lord and not allow this 
giant of unbelief to get them. Those who really are looking forward to experience that rest that Jesus Christ is saying, you know, he's promising to us. He said, come to me, those who are weary and those, those who are carrying heavy load. Oh, yes, Lord, I'm tired. <laughs> That's what I usually tell the Lord. I'm tired, Lord. I'm so tired carrying this load. I want to rest. And then I rest. And it's so good when you find that place of rest. Yes. Okay. Here is the bad report, the bad news. First Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We know about that. And in John 10, verse 10, the first part says, The thief, which is, the adversary, our adversary, the devil. The thief does not come except what? To steal and to kill and to destroy. That's his goal. Steal your joy, steal your rest, to prevent you from experiencing everything that God has for you. Oh, yeah, and if we all, you know, I'm only tasting a little bit, and I so enjoy that already. I'm only a, a tasting a little bit of that rest, and I'm... Oh, Lord, I really want that rest. That's why I'm sharing this. Those times that I, I'm finally able to enter that are so glorious. I want to do that more often. I want to be more diligent. Right? Why can't we rest? Nah, that's the question. Why can't we rest? What lies are you believing? We're busy believing the lies of the enemy. The reason why we can't rest is because we're too busy. We're too distracted. Our minds are full. Our brain is full of the lies of the enemy. You can't do that. They're too strong for you. Too bad. You're very weak. You don't have enough skills. You don't have enough gifts. No, they won't believe you. Huh? Too busy. Your brain is too full. Your mind is too full. Your heart is too full. That's why you can't enter your, the rest of God. What lies are you believing about God, about yourself, about your family? Our family will never be able to be at peace, especially the, during this <laughs> lockdown, isolation. We're all together. We're shouting, screaming, yelling. It's too noisy. And husband and wife quarreling. No, we'll never be able. You know, in China, after the lockdown, thousands of couples applied for divorce. That's what the lockdown does. <laughs> so what lies are you believing about your kids? Oh, they will never grow up. They will never mature. They're so like this and like that. What lies are you believing? But. Uh, so how do we do this? How do, how do we believe the lies of the enemy? What, are, what have we been doing? By dwelling in the past. You dwell in the past. Husbands and wives have history together. From the start, they courted, and then they got married. The first, the honeymoon, the first few years. And they have said things to one another. They can't forget. They put it there. And every now and then, they would... You said this to me. You told me the blah, 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 blah. You were like this to me. You did this to me. Telling in the past. Busy believing the lies of the enemy. By rewinding conversations or situations. Something happened an hour ago. Five hours after, you're still rewinding it. He said this. He said this. He said this. He said this. What does it mean? What's it? My boss told me this, blah, 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 blah. Two days after, you're still rewinding. Busy believing the lies of the end. If I fast forward, no, there's a rewinding. <laughs> there's a fast forwarding into the future. You've been, what will happen after the lockdown? About the economy? Everything is shutting down. Oh, I don't, will I have? What, will, will I still have a job? Will they still take me? How about my income? What, what will, what? 
I've taken my superannuation. What will happen when I get the hold? I don't have any money. Fast forwarding. And what does it do to you? You worry. You fear. You're scared. Another one is by hitting the pause button. Huh? There's rewinding. There's first fast forwarding. There's the pause button. What is it? We are stuck in the moment. Something happened now. And Two days after, ten days after, you're still there in that moment. We become paralyzed mentally and or emotionally. Shut down. Mentally shut down. You harden your heart to protect yourself. He did this to me. From now on, you will not get anything from me. <laughs> you can't move on. You're stuck there. We are unable. When you're unable to forgive, when you're unable to forgive, you become paralyzed mentally. When you're unable to forgive, you're in prison. Why we always say, not for their sakes, for your sake. So you can move on. And find God's rest. The good news is this. Hebrews 4, 1 to 3 says, God's promise of entering his rest, it still stands. It's still there. It's still available. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience. For this good news, what good news? That God has prepared this rest, has been announced to us just as it was to them. It did them no good because they didn't share the fate of God. For only we, who? We who believe and enter his rest. Unbelief is equal to unrest. Unrest is equal to unbelief. Belief or trust in God is equal to God's rest. How do we enter God's rest? Believing in him. It's easy to say that, but if you have all this, eh, you can't say you're believing in God if you're doing all this. If you're doing all that, if you're doing all this, you can't say, I'm believing in God, but I'm dwelling in the past. I'm believing God, I trust him, but you're rewinding conversations. I'm believing in God, you're fast forwarding into the future, you worry, you fear. I'm believing in God, but you're hitting the pause button, you're stuck in the moment. You're paralyzed mentally. You can't move on, you don't forgive. And you say you're trusting in God? You know, I'll send you that lady doctor to talk to you. She's very effective. <laughs> the good news. Yes, only we who believe can enter his rest. Now in Philippians chapter 4, 6 to 7, the message, it says, don't fret, don't worry. Instead of worrying, pray. What is this verse? Do you recognize this verse? Philippians 4, 6 to 7. This is, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And with thanksgiving and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, this is the message. It, it's a really good translation for this. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, God's rest. Everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. Entering God's place of rest. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. So good. If you do this, you bring your concerns to God. Not only sometimes, every time. I told you, when you feel unrest, that's what I do. That's not what I've been doing this past year or two. When he started revealing this to me, 
Unrest is equal to unbelief. I will be at work and then someone will tell me, we have an audit. Because my work at Woolworths is check dates. And then we will have an audit. I will be told about the audit sometimes as soon as I come in. No time <laughs> to be checked. Sometimes it's before I go home. So that night, oh God. And every single item that they find that is expired is $10,000 fine from the company. It puts a lot of pressure on me. And I would be just, oh, there's an audit. Oh, God. Unrest? Unbelief. And then I would come to God. Yes. Why do you have unrest? Unbelief. What's the unbelief? I don't believe you're able to deliver me from this. Too much. There's two lines of our executives are coming to check. Government also, all at the same time, are coming. There would be 10, 12 people who will be. And I'd be like, eh. God, but God, always able to. They always come back. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. They're able to. Right? And there's another promise there. Can't intend the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life. That's the promise. Jesus Christ said, I have come. Yes, I know the thief. That's the goal of the thief. But don't worry. Don't fret. Don't fear. Jesus Christ said, I have come that you may have life. And not only life, but that you may have it more abundant. And if you will just come into that promise, and if you will just believe him when he said that, when you have unrest, you would come before him. What's the unbelief, Lord? What am I not believing you? What's your promise? Why don't I believe you? Lord will give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about us. He does care about you. So much, we don't know the bounds. There's no bound to it. God's love for you is limitless. But because we are too busy believing the lies of the enemy, we are too busy, emotion, we are emotionally indisposed. We can't believe, we can't trust, we can't enter into that rest, we, we struggle to, to experience that rest. Because our hearts are full. Hearts are full with what? It's just believing the lies. And that's the problem, you know. It's, it's a really big problem. Okay, entering God's rest. How do we do this now? Recognize it for what it is. It is what? Unbelief. Number two, admit before the Lord your agreement with the lies of the enemy. Admit before the Lord. If you have any agreement with him, you've been believing the lies of the enemy. You come before him, before the Lord, and say, yes, Lord. I agreed with a lot of his lies. And then confess it. I confess, oh God, that it is a sin. It's not just stress. It's not just anxiety. It's not just panic attacks. It's not just nervous break. It is Unbelief. So confess your sin. Yes, Lord, I have sinned before. I have not believed you. I have not trusted you. I have worried. I, have, I was scared. Instead of going to you, I went to my false refuges. I drank myself to sleep. I watch a movie just so I won't think about these things that are bothering me. 
you feel these things that are bothering you. Instead, you find something that will distract you. You tell it to your friend instead of telling it to God. False refuge. John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins from all unrighteousness. Repent of your unbelief. Repent is turning away from it. Pastor, I'll always say, doing a 180 degrees. Turn around. If this is unbelief, you turn around. About faith. And then pray for new and good fruit. Pray for new and good fruit. Lord, give me new ways of reacting. Give me new ways. Let me learn new ways. Having good fruit. Ask the Holy Spirit. This is very important. This is what I've been doing. And I've developed a habit of this. Because I've asked the Holy Spirit, when he started revealing all this to me, I asked the Holy Spirit to give me alerts. Lord, give me alerts. Whenever you go back to the old way of living, ask him. If you ask him, he will answer you. Lord, give me alerts. Whenever I'm going back there, And try to listen, and I'm listening again to the lies of the enemy. And I have unrest, I have unbelief. Give me alerts. And then he will give it. And when he gives you that alert, go back to two, three. <laughs> when he gives you the alert, what will you do? Recognize it for what it is. Oh, it's unbelief. There's unrest in my heart. This is not just a normal stress, this is unbelief. How did you know it is unbelief? You ask the Lord, why are you alerting me, Lord? What's happening? He will tell you. He will tell you. And then admit before the Lord, oh, yes, Lord, I agree again with the lie of the enemy. Confess your sin. Repent of your unbelief. Pray for new and good fruit in that area where you have unbelief. And then continue on with your life and wait for the next alert. <laughs> right? Alerts of unrest. And this is what I want to tell. When God gives you alerts, listen to your heart. Why? Hello, heart. Why are you upset? Why is your reaction more than what's happening? Sandra Selmer, Kirsten Selmer, always say this. One of my mentors in inner healing. You always say this. Ask the Lord about it. Listen to your heart. What's happening? Why are you upset? Don't deny what it's saying. Don't ignore it. Don't just go around and pretend nothing's happening. Nothing's wrong. And this is very important. Don't condemn your heart. Why are you upset? Why are you, why are you reacting that way? And then you, you already ask forgiveness. You can't rest. Because you think what you've done is really bad. Why am I like this? Stop. Don't do that. It will only put you more unrest. Then it will be a cycle of unrest. Okay, learn to bring these times on of unrest. And then what do you do? Rest in his love. Rest. Sometimes when I'm about to sleep and I have to wake up early in the morning, there would be things that the Lord would reveal to me that happened and that I have to deal with them. But I didn't have time because that night I will be I was already late in sleeping. I won't have enough sleep and I'm, I'm waking up early. Before I've learned about this, I would try and settle it and, oh Lord, I have to go through the inner healing process and all that, but it will take me a lot of time. 
But nowadays I've learned, Lord, I'm really sorry. I've done that. Forgive me. Can I do this tomorrow? <laughs> can, I, can I go through the inner healing process and all this and, you know, tomorrow? I learned to rest. I know that he's not angry with me. He's just revealing it so that I will be able to deal with it. But he's not condemning me. He's not like, you've done that. You should, uh, you're not right with me. He's not like that. So I've learned to, okay, Lord, I see that. Forgive me, Lord. Sorry, Lord. For your blood. It is enough for me. I'm going to sleep. Lord, can I? It's okay. Can I rest? Okay. And then the next morning I will pick it up. But I write it in my notebook. I have a bedside note. So I write it there so I won't forget. Right? Rest in his love. Remember you're in a journey. Be patient with yourself. After you learn this, you start doing it. You start praying to God. Tomorrow you'll go through it again. Tomorrow again, the next day. One year after, you're still at it. Be patient. With oh, it's all right. God's not angry. God's not rushing you. It's not an overnight miracle. But be diligent. Create a habit. Build a habit. Don't panic. Remember that preaching? Don't panic. God's got this. God's got you. Right? Okay, so. Praise God. <laughs> and now we are concluding. Here's the conclusion. Thank you, Lord God. As we, you know, the second Corinthians chapter 12. Seven. So to keep me, this is Paul speaking. To keep me from becoming proud, I was given my flesh, messenger Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Now, what is a thorn in my flesh that Paul is talking about? If you research that, you will find a thousand different interpretations of that from Bible scholars. And you'll never get you know, the one that you can't really understand. What's the thorn in the flesh? I don't know. It's, a, it's an ailment. It's a, the eye disease. It's whatever. But let's not go there. Let's go to the next one. Three times, <coughs> three different times, I begged the Lord, take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. The other translation says, my grace is sufficient. New Living Translation says, my grace is all you need. I like that. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's what you do when you have the alerts. You don't go to your false refuges. You don't go to your, to your wine, to your beer, to your Netflix, to your friend. Later you can. I'm not saying don't. You go to God. That's the first thing. You, you, ha you can ask prayer requests. That's all right. No problem with that. But before you even ask for the prayer request, go to God. It's the first thing. Because what he said, my grace is all you need. His grace. Now, as we close today, I want to ask, what is it that's troubling you today or in the past weeks? Or even past year, 10 years, 20 years, what is it that is troubling you? What upsets you? What bothers you? What triggers your anxiety attacks or your panic attacks? What's the trigger? Is it your husband, your kid, your work, your boss? You're thinking about the future, your Lack of finances. 
whatever it is, whatever you call it, remember that the Bible calls it unbelief. And if there is unbelief, there's unrest. If there is unrest, ask God if there is unbelief. Ask for the alert. God gives you the alert. Come to him. Repent. Go all over again. This will take time. There will come a time when you will be familiar with this, with the alerts. And then, little by little, you will be able to enter that place of rest. And it is so good to be able to just rest in his love, to just know that he loves you. He's not angry. He's not condemning you. He already died on the cross for you. He's not about to be upset about that thing you did. He's provided his blood for that. All he wants for you is to believe, to trust him, and to claim it for yourself. You know, in Wikipedia, it says grace is the love and mercy given to us by God because he desires us to have it. Not because of anything we have done to earn. Like that definition. It is the love and mercy given to us by God. Because what? Just because. <laughs> Just because he desires us to have it. I want you to have it. This grace, and you know what is his grace? A lot of things we undeserved favor, unmerited, but it's actually his death on the cross and everything that it means. That's his grace. His blood that he shed, his resurrection life. That's his grace. And he desires us to have it. And it's not because you're so good, you're so skillful, you're so talented. You know, the performance orientation that Pastor Al is always talking about. It's not because you're so nice, you're so kind. It's because he just wants you to have it because he loves you. And it's not because of anything we have done. It's his mercy, his love. And this is my own definition of grace. Grace is Jesus Christ dying for us on the cross, paying for our sin of unbelief so that we can enter his rest. That's grace for me. He's been telling me, come to my rest. I can't. <laughs> Too busy. Too busy, busy believing the lies of the enemy. He said, you're weary. You're so burdened. Come. Like, Lord, what will I do? I paid for your sin of unbelief. Come. It's okay. It's okay. So we will pray right now. And for those of you who are watching this and you haven't yet started this journey of entering the rest of God through faith in Jesus Christ, you actually don't understand what I'm talking about, about Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary, about, about him paying for your sin of unbelief and other sins. For those of you who have not taken that step into the love and mercy of Jesus Christ, you are not yet born again. You heard about it. You thought it's a religion. No, it's an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a life that is merged with the life of Jesus Christ. It's being born from above. It's being a child of God. It's entering into the kingdom of God and experiencing everything that he's provided for you through his death on the cross and his resurrected life. I'm talking to you right now. If you hear his voice today, today, harden not your heart. We're not offering you a religion. We're not offering you Bible knowledge. We're offering you the chance. Today, right this very moment, wherever you are, we're offering you 
an opportunity to accept the love and mercy that Jesus Christ is offering you just because he wants you to have it, not because you, of anything you have done. And you don't have to prove yourself to God before you actually step into that threshold and accept the gift of salvation for yourself. You don't have to work for it. Come as you are. He's ready to accept you now. If you're ready, just by faith. Faith that God is giving you right now so that you will experience what I'm talking about right now. So if you want to be in this journey into receiving this gift of salvation, would you pray? Lord Jesus, I understand that you died on the cross for me, for myself. So that I will be able to experience your love and mercy. So that I will be able to receive all that you are into. So I come before you. Thank you. For I thank you. I want to forgive me for my. I can. Yes, that I am a sinner. And that I cannot save myself. That you already, you already can. So I come before you. And I believe what Jesus Christ Ask your life, your kingdom. Be my Lord. Today, I am not hardening. I am opening my heart, allowing you to take over. I want to start this journey. Enter it. Through Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit. And for those of you who already are. But through Jesus. Come and read. Right now, wherever you are. Say it in your. And all those right now, ask God. For new and good. Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for this. Thank you, O oh Lord God. Thank you so much, O oh God. Thank you so much that you are so good to us. Thank you so much, O oh Lord God, that you have offered your life to us. Thank you, my Lord. Bless this word. Bless it in the hearts of everyone who receives this and listens to this. Let it take root. And let it have a harvest. Lord God, we thank you, Father God. And we bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God bless you all. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you for the word. All right. We all need God's rest. And uh, thank you for...
I'm so lucky for having my wife uh, uh, <laughs> helping me giving some messages like this. I remember my father when I was still a uh, young uh, boy, and uh, every time I know that I, my father is at home, I so much confident that everything will be okay. That's how you find rest, when you trust. Same thing with God, God our Father. You know, I mean, finding rest with the Lord. Um, you know that when God is there, you know that everything will be all right. Trust God, right? Okay. Uh, if you can grab your Bible, we go to our Numbers chapter 6. All uh, right. Grab your kids. Let us recite this. Uh, let us recite this. Blessings. All the Father, if you can grab your kids and lay your hands upon them and release these blessings to them. All right, Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. It's not there. So just grab your Bible. Maybe uh, most of you already memorized this. <laughs> All right, okay. Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. Okay. Okay, one, two, three. Let's all uh, recite this together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Father God, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you for this day. Let, your, uh, let this day, O oh God, be a, uh, a blessed day, Lord God, for every one of us. So thank you, Lord God. Bless every, every one of God who's at home. And uh, Lord God, thank you for everything. Thank you for your message, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. All right. So uh, thank you and God bless you. All right. Uh, so uh, <laughs> my wife is not there uh, doing the uh, outro. So <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I hope I'll, I'll see you. I'll see you next Sunday. We'll be talking uh, next Sunday about regeneration. So uh, prepare yourself, and uh, I'm so excited to see you again. And